So hi, this is my um, talk for DAS uh, Life Sciences uh, Lightning Talks. So now I'm Shaz Khan, I've got a startup called Discorton, and as you can tell, I am that classic example of a startup in a basement. Uh, my wife got the uh, upstairs office uh, during the pandemic. She said she had a proper job, and she's right. <laughs> so um, my company uh, is involved in two areas, which are, look, I've got like all startups, uh, I'm doing a bootstrap, uh, so I'm providing a service in applied research, which is some of the work that we'll talk to you about, and then I've got something involving uh, bioimaging techniques using uh, optical bio uh, for material science ca characterization. Okay, so just a quick background on me and uh, the application, and then the use case, because it's not a traditional uh, use case of uh, dusk for you guys. So, uh, background to me, I used to work on Sensodyne toothpaste, and in fact, uh, if you buy a brand new one, I probably invented it, so biophysics and biomaterials involving bone uh, regeneration materials, and then sticking them in toothpaste, and multimodal imaging as well. So, when I mean multimodal imaging, my job was to go out and show how toothpaste worked uh, with an imaging technique, and so here's some examples of data I can show you. 99% of what I, can, uh, I did, I can't show you, uh, because... Uh, my old company owns all of that. But this is some of the stuff that's published or some, say some newer work that I've done that I can share. So this is some great work with the collaborators in, at Glasgow University uh, using confocal microscopy, looking at biofilms and different complexities, live dead st staining, and then something similar here. But this is a kind of a um, hard tissue, soft tissue interface. And then you've also got here um, some newer work that I've done involving hardware based uh, super resolution so no deconvolution or hard computational tasks on this one this is a really nice technique uh, if you want the ease of um, yeah super resolution uh, it's a great little technique out of the, uh, uh, the Netherlands and then to nanotomography although uh, so this is these are larger channels that are a micron with 200 nanometer interconnections from a tooth uh, that was done at ESRF, uh, the synchrotron and ID16A. Uh, funnily enough, I did a huge amount, maybe like 15 or more 24-hour uh, beam signs at, e at ESRF at ID19. But most of that I can't show you. Uh, but then I've also got some lab XCT from a paper that I had with uh, Portsmouth University with a couple of guys called Asa Barber, who's now London South Bank, and a guy called um, Alex Cow, who's an awesome uh, microscopist actually um, and then what I'm going to talk to you about today is an application of imaging and then how I've used DASC uh, for that so I'm going to talk to you about a great little project that started out as a demo um, with a professor called uh, Professor Fabrizio Scarpa at University of Bristol uh, who's a professor of aeronautic materials smart materials and composites and auxetic uh, foams is the project now, as I said to you, and you probably guessed, I spent this huge amount of time uh, working on teeth. So most of what I've shown you is our teeth. So uh, Fabrizio was very kind enough to send me some of his auxetic foams uh, to look at something other than teeth on a technique I hadn't really used before, but I thought might work, and luckily it did. Uh, so what are auxetic foams? So they're really quite cool materials. So, so you'll find them in trainers or in aeronautics as anti-vibration materials. So they are a material with a negative Poisson uh, ratio. So when you pull them apart, they will get fatter. So they've got this uh, internal linkage structure, uh, which will create these uh, different things sometimes. Actually, funny enough, if you've ever seen those weird packaging materials you get and you're like, you're pulling them apart and they just change shape, that's an auxetic material. So they're around in a lot of places, uh, and yeah, so they're a really interesting material. When you're looking at some of these types of materials, you know, and you look at them in 3D, typically the material sciences, the main go-to things are X-ray CT, great, sure there's always FibSEM, but it's electron microscopy, and then you've got surface profilometry with optical imaging. Uh, but really, XCT is your main 3D uh, technique to look at internal microstructure and I kind of I said to Fabrizio look I'd like to look at something other than teeth but also I really think there's this whole uh, missing gambit of uh, biological optical techniques has been this fantastic revolution and people are not using it in other areas apart from in uh, cell biology or, or organoid research 
so what I'm going to talk to you uh, is the application of that material with this technique called multi-photon microscopy, specifically two photons. So we won't go into the uh, big of it, but it's similar to confocal, but you have no pinhole. And you use two uh, uh, photons uh, to excite a fluorescence or autofluorescence. Uh, and what you're almost doing is an in-situ point spread function. So you're literally uh, reducing some of the scatter and the information that can occur additional out of focus information, which is why you don't really need a uh, pinhole because you're trying to concentrate a smaller volume as this little diagram on the left here and what's great about it confocal max you'll maybe get is a uh, hundred microns if you're lucky but here they say one millimeter or even deeper so this is a paper from uh, someone uh, in 2016 where they did up to you know, nearly 1.6 uh, millimeters you know 1600 microns that's amazing depth if you think about it it has a similar resolution to confocal so it's not super res techniques, though there are, I believe, some super resolution techniques. And even here you can see, this is a one photon confocal uh, image, actually, you can see all that excitation path. And here, let me see, actually the superposition of these two wavelengths, and I think it's more about the absorption and superposition, the vibration of those um, uh, molecules that are fluorescing. Um, I've got to remember that this is a new technique for me, so if I get this wrong, Please don't get upset with me. But this is uh, what I've gleaned off so far. So these two photons are uh, a hit at femtoseconds, one after the other. One's absorbed before that's actually finished vibration in the molecule. You're hitting it with another, so you get actually a wave superposition as uh, in the absorption. Uh, so you can see you're only uh, fluorescing one very small part. Um, so that's an awesome technique. So I actually, it kind of worked. But it also kind of didn't because so I used the fluorescent dye technique that I borrowed from a group out of Toronto that they'd done some similar kind of foam structures and it worked and we got this really horribly noisy image as you can tell so this is a VTK widgets uh, or uh, IP widgets uh, and yeah it was noisy as anything but you can see something great now image processing is one of those things that if the imaging goes beautifully you don't have to do much but here unfortunately we can even see in this histogram that's shown uh, as part of the widget. So I always use it in the 2D size. Really easy way just to look at some data. Um, yeah, very quickly, what are you looking at? And you can see here, there's information in here, but there's a lot of noise. Now, one of the things that I find slightly annoying is a lot of equipment manufacturers for these microscopes. They get you to use their techniques. Or well, there's some information probably in that meta uh, file that they don't share with us. It's actually doing some image processing. So guys will go and look at these uh, images and go, wow, these are looking amazing. And as soon as you take them to something else, they look terrible. It's because they're actually doing some baselining and pre-processing already. And when I uh, had uh, the guy who showed me this technique, he was like, oh, when I look at it in the viewer that we have with the guy, it looks amazing. And it's like, ah, that's a change that you don't know about. So that's one thing. It's good to know for anyone out there who's doing some image processing. If it's coming from uh, one viewer to another that's kind of owned by the same group, they're probably going to be doing stuff. So you think, oh, that's a really bad image. What can we do with it? Well, okay. What am I using data for? Sure. Let me tell you now, this is not a huge data set. This is 200 megabytes. Okay. 200 megabytes is not really big. But if you think about a lot of the libraries that we will use, OpenCV, um, scikit image itk we talk about memory copies in python and any type of uh, programming language when you create an array and you have you know maybe some possible copies filling up your memory 200 megabytes i've got a laptop here that's 16 gigabytes why would you need to spend a fortune on loads of uh you know going to the cloud or, or, or a big desktop it's 200 megs well here's the reason why do you know what those libraries are doing are they making intermediate results in the middle of it? For example, I, I take my 275 meg uh, file, I take it through a process from a library, and it makes multiple copies. And then by uploading, I'm suddenly at two gigs, and then suddenly there's five copies in memory, and then I output. Now, you could lose that at some point, but you might be hitting a wall. So I've been using Dask to chunk it, and in fact, I chunk it in specific directions of the, uh, the actual... Um, computation so if i'm doing some um uh, for example some um illumination correction well i don't want to be doing it where it's bright and chunking it there i want to do it along the way and chunk it 
So we've got similar types of illumination that have been uh, uneven enough. So you work it out across the whole thing. So you've got uh, equivalent amount, or maybe you chunk it in different ways because you just want to shove through lots of quick computations. Okay. So that's what I've been using Dasmo. Actually reducing the overhead with an in-memory data set because you don't really think about what you may be able to do. So you can go do a library and yeah, it kind of works, but you notice, hang on a minute, it's taken up huge amounts of memory. Uh, and you don't know why, or it falls over, and actually it takes longer and longer to process. And a lot of the time, the great thing about Python, and I work in Jupyter Lab, is actually it's that, inact, uh, that interactive analysis. It's not the fastest thing in the world, but it's a way to work through it intuitively, and prototype, and if you can't do it fast enough, or in a way that's uh, going to allow you to think through different problems uh, in, in, a, in a shorter amount of time, you're going to be waiting ages and the thoughts not still in your head of why you originally went down this route. So that's why Dask has been really important for me. Holding those computations, yes, I will work with bigger data sets with Dask. Uh, so where is this going for me? Well, let's let's talk about uh, Napari that I used. So I took that Dask data set, processed it with Dask Image and a few other uh, libraries such as Scikit Image, uh, where I used my own um, throwing together um, you know, histogram equalization and that data set doesn't look so noisy now. It still needs a little bit more work. And this was uh, the data set that was the worst, but I've gone back and don't worry, it, as a project has also been started with Fabrizio, he's paying for now. Uh, I've used a much lower fluorescent dye and the data is much more cleaner. So I've been able to kind of prototype and understand the right um, libraries to use and the right process flow through Dask because I've been able to do it without getting stuck going, oh, I don't know what to do. It's finding the right chunking scheme. Now, that's great. But what can I do with this? What well, me personally, what I'm going to do is continue to explore these techniques in other areas. So I want people to be able to take techniques and learn what they can do to create new uh, applications of them. And I'm going to continue with Dask as well. So everything from additive manufacturing, batteries research, and Dask, uh, Dask coupled with uh, general processing GPU libraries. So on top of that, I am trying to work with GPUs with uh, some training I'm taking undertaking with Consight, uh, which I'm. I've been, I'm just started, so don't ask me any questions about that. Uh, so thank you for your uh, your time, and I hope you've enjoyed the talk.